Hello, my name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are all about creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, underrepresented audiences, and first generation to graduate high school and college into the education, employment, and economic mobility pipeline. We are doing a series of different sessions this week and we're delighted that this session today is closing a really wonderful week in honor of Educator Appreciation Week. So it's my pleasure to uh, tell you a little bit about um, the team here today and actually Lisa Roy, who I've known for a few years, and she is at the um, Buffett Institute in a role as Executive Director for Early Childhood Education at the University of Nebraska. And before that, she was at Denver Public Schools supporting 5,000 three to four-year-olds in the district with 2,500 half-day uh, early childhood students and 40-some um, staff members. And she is a major equity pioneer in the space. And she is going to tell you a little bit about this session and the people that are assembled to really guide you during this time. Because during COVID-19, early childhood has been one of the biggest issues impacted. And um, I know that our team is gonna share a lot so that we can navigate through all of that now. So Lisa, it's my pleasure to introduce you and I will wrap us up at the end and tell you about some programs next week from Global Minded on celebrating our graduates uh, 2020. So we'll, uh, we'll look forward to uh, sharing that um, before you all close out. Great, thank you, Carol. It's an honor to be here. And again, you're with the Equity Begins with Early Childhood. Uh, we have Martha Caulfelt with us, as well as Christine Thurstenson and Heather Duncan. Uh, we are going to talk about some innovative partnerships that we have, and we'll be kicked off with Martha talking about the importance of brain development. So I'm very excited about this. We'll also talk about COVID and its impact on the work that we're doing and on children and families. So I will uh, talk a little bit about the Buffett Early Childhood Institute um, after our three speakers um, go on, but I did want to let you know I'm the director, not the executive director. Our executive director is actually Dr. Samuel Mizells, and you'll have to look him up. Incredible early childhood advocate, and I'm very honored uh, to work with him and some of my coworkers who I believe are on this webinar today. So let's kick it off with Martha, please, talking about uh, beginning with the brain and mind. Great, thank you, Lisa. Hello and um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for this session today. Well, my role here today is to maybe uh, lay out a few foundational pieces about um, elements that are gonna be so important for a whole child approach to an, er an equitable early childhood program. And so just very quickly, I was a classroom teacher for many, many years, uh, um, upper grades, lower grades, primary grades, early, early years. And I had an experience in um, about 1985 that changed the trajectory of my whole career. And that was that I had a chance to work with a neuroscientist, Dr. Marion Diamond from University of California um, at Berkeley. And she was sharing at this um, uh, workshop or a seminar, she was sharing her most recent research that was uh, being published on something called neuroplasticity. And um, I, I was just fascinated because at this session, she was sharing about that the research, um, uh, the research up until then hadn't uh, uh, given us a, a concrete evidence, but her research was giving concrete evidence that with experiences in um, multi-sensory experiences, that in fact, maybe we actually can um, influence brain growth and development, especially in the early years. And she closed out that session with this quote. She said, so if we know that the brain is the main organ for learning, why aren't all educators brain experts? I always say that was kind of a mic drop moment, even though mic drop moments hadn't been invented yet. But uh, I, it just struck me that teachers and um, uh, educators and early years uh, caregivers, et cetera, 
really uh, had not been given a lot of uh, concrete information about how brains learn best. So I'm going to give us just a, a, a couple of key points uh, as a foundational piece because you are going to hear about some absolutely incredible programs, early childhood programs, and you are going to see how they are absolutely built and designed with the brain in mind. So let's put up the first slide, Lisa. Thank you. That up on neuroplasticity. There we go. So Dr. Diamond's work was on something called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the concept that our neurons, you're born with about 100 billion neurons, and that they are very immature at birth. So if you look at the uh, drawing on the far left-hand side, the immature neuron, that uh, they, I always say that we kind of use our hand as a model here. There's the cell body and branches that come off uh, that are dendrites and then their long tail, that axon. And neurons, uh, even in utero, but after birth, just start sprouting like mad. And you can see that second image there of a more mature neuron, is that with stimulation, with multi-sensory experiences, our neurons are actually prompted to reach out and grow and make connections with other neurons. In fact, the scientific term is that they get bushier. And so a, a, a neuron that is developing is going to start looking like that second one with lots of dendritic spines that are reaching out and making connections. So one neuron reaches out and starts connecting with another neuron. Now look at the uh, slide on the right, because Dr. Diamond actually showed us this one back in 1985, that they were starting to use brain imaging techniques, and we were able to see how brain density actually changes with um, um, these multisensory experiences. So that first image is the density of neurons in the cerebral cortex, the thinking area of your brain, on just a two week old infant. So you can see that these are very immature neurons. But look what happens already by the time a child is two years old. Look at the interconnections. Look at all of the dendrites have grown and reached out and connected. And so um, with multisensory experiences in a safe and secure environment, we start getting this growth. Now, Dr. Diamond right away said to us that, um, you know, 20 and 30 years ago, we kept saying, oh, all these connections are done in just the first couple of years or by age five. And now we know that our brains continue to make these connections and grow and reach out and connect um, all the way into adulthood. Yay. So, uh, but we certainly know that near 90% of the initial connections are going to happen in those early years. So uh, let's look at the second slide. So what are the key elements then that are going to uh, be needed to be in place to promote the most amount of growth and connections in a young child's brain. And so first of all, we know that it has to be a safe and secure environment. And then we know that of course, uh, their nutrition needs have to be met. We knew that they, we certainly know that they need to have big body movement and even rough and tumble play as well as organized maybe exercise. They need multi-sensory stimulation. The brain seeks out novelty, so things that are curious and things that uh, might be interesting to explore. And we know the brain likes a good challenge, so sometimes brains really like to work on hard puzzles and things uh, for a, a long time. We know that opportunities to just have discovery play and not have um, a rigid schedules, just a chance to mess around with things. And of course, all of this uh, needs to happen when children are in safe and uh, secure and in relationship with other students and with adults. And of course, all of this is uh, helping to promote language development. Now, you can already imagine and see that we have many students that arrive with some of these criteria, the essentials not available to them in their home life. And so our early childhood programs just become um, a place where we need to address the whole child and hopefully promote lots of brain growth and development. So keep these elements in mind as you hear about these three fantastic programs because these are the equity essentials to build young brains. Thanks, Lisa. That was perfect, Martha. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Christine and she'll talk to us about her work in Silicon Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. 
Great. Well, I am just so thrilled to be here today to share a little bit about our program, The, the Big Lift. Um, and I'll have to tell you the story. I started out as a, my professional career as a high school teacher. And I remember doing one placement in a kindergarten classroom and I walked away thinking, oh, I'm never going there. That I don't know what's going on. And you know, little did I know that later in my life, my path would take me around to focusing entirely on early education and realizing and discovering the amazing things that are going on in those little brains like Martha just described. Um, so Silicon Valley, as many of you know, it's an area of tremendous wealth, tremendous innovation, but it is also an area of tremendous inequities and great need. Uh, and in fact, right here in San Mateo County, we find that about 45% of our children are not ready for kindergarten. And that gap persists for them. And we have 41% of our third graders who are not reading at grade level. And we know that third grade reading is a real indicator of future success in high school graduation. So we use that as a marker. And our local data just confirms what the national data is has been telling us for a while, that gaps that exist at kindergarten persist to third grade, and then it becomes very, very challenging to reduce that gap and for those children to catch up by the time they graduate from high school. And so for us here in Silicon Valley, this was a matter of equity. It was just not okay that that many of our children, and in fact, the numbers are significantly higher when we look at our children of color. And we said, this is not okay. We cannot have this here. We need to take steps to disrupt this process and disrupt what's happening before kindergarten. And so the big lift was started. And the big lift uh, started back in planning in 2012, implementation in 2014. We're um, heading into our sort of fifth year of our proof of concept phase with it. And it is a bold social venture that leverages the power of collective impact to bring together over 300 different partners to focus on giving kids the right start to their education and their foundation. So when we started creating the Big Lift, we knew that children exist within a complex system. And so that simply focusing on one aspect would not be enough to get the results we were looking for. So we created a multi-prong program that would take into account a variety of different factors and support children in all aspects. So what we did is we have four pillars. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, Lisa, that would be great. So we thought we needed to work at a whole child perspective. So we have four different boosts or pillars that we focus on. So the first I'll just touch on briefly is attendance. And we, needed to, we knew that it was really important for kids to be in school if they were going to learn. And so we use positive messaging and reinforcement to encourage families to get their kids to school and to school on time. And we start with that messaging back in preschool so that they're in a regular pattern by the time they get into kindergarten and then on to third grade. Uh, we do family engagement, uh, and we know how important families are, particularly for preschoolers. The family is really their center of their world. And so we needed to partner and support our families for them to be teachers just as well as, as their classroom teachers. Um, so we do a variety of different strategies for family engagement. We understand that we needed to address summer learning loss and that for the kids who didn't have the opportunity to go to um, fancy summer camps and enrichment programs, that the, what was happening over the summer was not okay with them. So we provide an inspiring summer program for four weeks that provides academic supports, as well as really fun, active, engaging STEM activities. And then our last boost was providing high quality preschool programs. So we feel it's really important for all of our kids in San Mateo County to have access to two years of high quality preschool. So we have expanded capacity. We provide slots for about 2000 children in San Mateo County to attend preschool. Uh, and we also have a team that works on making sure that it's high quality preschool and so that kids are getting what they need. So when we put all of those things together, that's the big lift. And that it is a big lift. And that's why it takes so many different partners. Um, and when we think about how does this work? How can we possibly manage this and get it to succeed? And so far, we are seeing success. We are seeing an increase in our kinder kindergarten readiness rates, an increase in our quality of our preschools. We have achieved significant increases in attendance within our schools. The real key to success for us has been the strong leadership. This was um, an initiative that was done um, in partnership with three backbone agencies. So we work with 
the foundation itself with our county and with our county office of education. And so collectively they have had the vision to make this happen. And they've had the dedication and the patience because change like this takes a long time. And oftentimes foundations are not patient with results. So having somebody focus on it and allow us the time to achieve these results has been really important. And it's allowed us the time to build the trust. So we've built trust with these organizations and now we can work together to support our kids and families. And so that's the story of the big lift. Thanks. Great, thank you, Christine, appreciate it. And now we'll hear from Heather and she'll talk to us about the collaboration for early childhood. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I feel like it's really great that I followed these two ladies because what they laid out just leads right into what I'm talking about. Um, I am Heather Duncan. I'm the Director of Early Learning at the Collaboration for Early Childhood, which is a very small but mighty um, nonprofit in a township just outside of Chicago, like touching Chicago in some spots. That's how close it is. Um, and, but it is its own entity. And it's a really wonderful, diverse, rich community. And um, similar to what Christine was talking about, it actually is a, a, a community with a lot of privilege, maybe not quite like Silicon Valley. That's a, a special situation, but it is a, um, a very stable and secure community and very progressive and a wonderful, wonderful place to work. And I don't live there, I live in the city, but um, apparently a wonderful place to live as well. Um, because in 2003, the governmental agencies, and there are a number in our, in our area, it's uh, the village and the township and a number of other things, but they all came together to um, guide my organization and fund it. Uh, we're also funded by the two school districts, and that's the elementary district and the high school district, which is separate um, in our area. Um, all of these came together because they realized that while early childhood is actually the place where all of our success starts. And so we need to really be thinking about how we're having children enter school. So very similar to um, what the people forming the big lift were thinking about. And in Illinois, I was unaware until I started working at the collaboration um, just over a year ago that a number of these collaborations exist throughout our state. Illinois is a really um, strong state as far as early childhood goes. Um, we get a lot of funding. We try to use it wisely. What I did not know after I joined this great organization, though, was that other people were having a lot of trouble getting their collaborations kind of off on um, the same trajectory as ours. We really had a lot of support from the community because it's a very involved community, involved to the point where, you know, um, it could be meddlesome sometimes, it, it can be um, intrusive. And so what the collaboration does is leverage all of that energy and then the um, support of the governmental agencies themselves to bring everyone together to focus on our strategic priorities. So our top priority is high quality preschool for all children. That's like our umbrella. But then professional development for all of the early childhood teachers and providers and administrators in our area and a neighboring community called River Forest. Um, parent information and su support and developmental screening. So it grew from a, a focus on um, preschool into those other areas. The parent information and support focuses on children zero to three. Developmental screening focuses on any child um, under kindergarten age so we can make sure that everyone is actually ready for kindergarten. The thing is, all of these areas have been historically separate. And what the collaboration seeks to do is to align all of those. And as I have come into the picture, to align them a little bit further. Um, I taught mostly preschool, but preschool, kindergarten, first grade um, for 21 years until 2018 when I joined the collab. And it, I realized some, maybe in the middle of my career, that there were disconnects. There are disconnects between me and the next grade. There are disconnects between the families and the school. 
And once those disconnects are smoothed over, then you've got what should be a, a wonderful track for children, at least up to third grade, which is where my expertise runs out. But if we can get it all aligned up until then, then we should be able to make the connections between third grade and fourth grade and beyond. So my goal um, and one of my main jobs at the Collab has been to leverage all the positivity that happens in our area um, and in our community to uh, galvanize folks around the idea of best practices that, that create a collaboration from, for families all the way through schools. What I have um, been working on is a, an outreach program called Acorns to Oaks that will help folks communicate with families from the birth, maybe even before the birth of their children, if we're lucky, um, through preschool and then kindergarten. And that's as far as we've gone so far, but the goal is to get it all the way through high school. What we want to do is make sure that there are certain conversations, um, certain language, certain understandings that families have, that providers have, that then kindergarten teachers have, and on and on and on, so that um, families and children are all on the same page and moving children toward the success that they need in kindergarten. What we found in um, our studies, there's a, a new kindergarten assessment that's been um, happening in Illinois for maybe the last three years called the Kids Assessment. And similar to what was found in Silicon Valley, fewer than 50% of our kids were actually deemed ready for kindergarten. Now, those of us who are early childhood experts, um, a lot of us take those numbers with a grain of salt simply because a lot of us know that in some cases, kindergarten is not really ready for children. Kindergarten has moved far, far away from the play-based, um, really wonderful um, experience that a lot of us that are adults remember into a much more academic and developmentally inappropriate place. So the goal is to align the understandings of all of the people who are reaching young children, make sure that they understand what children need to grow and develop and um, grow those neurons and have that curiosity that leads them beyond um, just playing or sitting in chairs and learning, but doing a, a combination of those things, the kinds of things that actually get them ready to be lifelong learners and successful students. And we can really start that at the very beginning. And that's the goal of the collab and, and me and my job. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. So we will go to the next slide. And I am Lisa Roy. I was in Denver, Colorado for more than 30 years. Uh, I would say about 35 years and recently moved to Omaha to become the Director of Program Development with the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska. If you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you, Lisa. So I was hired specifically to oversee a unit that includes work on what's called the Superintendent's Early Childhood Plan. And it is funded by mill dollars in the Metro Omaha area. There are 11 school districts. However, our work concentrates on six of those that have schools with the highest levels of poverty. And as you can see from the description, our goal is to close the, what we would call equity achievement gap, opportunity gap for children from birth to third grade. I have several of my coworkers uh, on the webinar, as I mentioned earlier today, and they do a myriad of things. Um, Chris Lopez Anderson, who's uh, my interim associate director uh, is a former principal that had comprehensive services in her school. So she works with the principals in our uh, six school districts and, and up to the 11 and beyond uh, to help them to understand what a school as hub can look like. How schools can actually ensure that they are looking at young children as their students before they enter the doors in pre-K or kindergarten. That they have a relationship with parents from the very beginning. 
And uh, I really enjoyed hearing from the other presenters. And as we are moving into what we call 2.0, uh, with making some slight changes in our programming, I would hope that we would be able to reach out to our parents when they're pregnant and during the prenatal years so that we can really make a difference on brain development then. Um, I would also like to point out that with the superintendent's plan, we have home visitation. Uh, we also have family facilitators that reach out to parents and we have what's called education facilitators that do coaching with teachers to ensure that they're looking at children from an equity lens and have high expectations for kids and are uh, ensuring that the learning environments are high quality. We do use a lot of different tools to measure the impact of our programming. And so um, I can list a couple of those. It's Hover's class. We have a family engagement survey. We use the ASQ3 and the ASQSE, the Woodcock Johnson, the Woodcock Munis, MAP, MESS, uh, just to name a few. And so we're really based on research practice. And then the Institute itself also looks at workforce de de development um, and public engagement. And so research and policy are very important to the work of the Institute as well as the program development team. We also have what's called an, the Department of uh, Professional Learning, uh, which is new to the Institute. And Dr. Amy Mart is uh, running that. And that um, entails another two components of the superintendent's plan, which is a pro professional development for all, which is training for childcare providers and teachers pre-K through third grade. Um, and then also what we call customized assistance. And it's a way to reach out to schools to provide them with any technical assistance, training or PD that they might need to get to the next level and operating a pre-K through third grade hopefully uh, pre-K meaning birth to third grade initiative within their schools. So that's it for me. We went through things pretty quickly. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is just to turn to uh, everyone in our uh, presentation uh, the, to talk about how we're dealing with COVID. So I'm going to have Christine Heather and Martha share a little bit about that. I'll round it out and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Christine, why don't we have you go first, then we'll have Heather, Martha can talk about it overall. I'll end it with uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, clearly COVID-19 has had a significant impact on our programs and our families and the stress that they're experiencing. Um, and they've certainly, we recognize that our staff are a critical component of, of all of this as well. So what, what we have done, um, we've changed a few things. We've moved some, some things around with our programs. Um, but the first thing we did is we ensured with our preschool providers, most of, of our programs are closed. A few have reopened for emergency child care centers, but the vast majority of them are closed at the moment, but we have not laid off any of our staff. So we have made sure that our staff are still working, still being um, paid. We felt that was, was very important for them and for their continuity. And they're using this time to reach out to all of our families. They make regular contact with them. Um, they're developing and sending home different learning activities that can be done with a little bit of technology help or without technology at all, depending on the family situation and what's appropriate. Um, they're also making sure that all of our families are connected to vital core service agencies in case of they have need for rental assistance. Um, we have one program where 95% of the parents uh, have lost their job. And so that's just an indicator of the tremendous level of need um, that we have. So we're making sure that that program has diapers, has wipes, has things to distribute to families. 
Um, one of the things we did with our attendance work, obviously you cannot reach out and encourage kids to come to school when they're not allowed to be in school. Um, but we have a great system in place for reaching families and, by, and to reach them via paper mail, which in this situation turns out is probably the best way to reach these hard to reach families. People move a lot, um, cell phones may or may not work, email ch checks. So our attendance messaging is no longer about attendance, but it's about how they can get help. It's about coping with family stressors. It's about where they can find resources. Um, and so we're sending out, out different messages. Um, We've upped our family engagement support for our staff. So they're getting specific training on dealing with um, the kind of stressors our families are, are in and how they can reach out to them. And then the other thing that we're super excited about is that we have now been given the green light to move ahead with our summer um, learning program. So we are going to be able to hold an in-person program this summer with a lot of modifications. <laughs> There's a lot of things that have to take place to make it safe for children and families, but we're hoping to serve about 800 kids, which is significantly less than we normally do, but to serve about 800 kids this summer um, and help ease them back into an academic, a, a physical academic environment um, and give them some stability and a little academic boost for what they've missed. So it's kind of how, how we've pivoted and we just know that plans for moving them ahead are gonna have to really take into account the trauma and stress of our families. And that's probably gonna be our main focus for, for next year. Great, thank you, Heather. So the collaboration is, um, a connector organization. So we don't run programs, we just partner with all the programs in our communities. And so we found that at the beginning of the, the crisis, that our main job was connecting all of the people that we touch with the resources and the information that they needed. I felt like for the first couple of weeks, we were just kind of triaging, just like putting our fingers over holes in information dikes all over the place, trying to make sure that everybody was getting what they needed. Um, there were directives coming out every day, um, every couple of days from all the government agencies in the state, um, explaining how people could get support, how people could, how centers and programs could get funding so that they didn't have to lay off their staff. Um, for our public schools, there was a lot of um, scrambling to make sure that children could um, have contact with their teachers, uh, making sure that folks had technology. And if they didn't have technology, that they had access to um, some way to get their, their materials. And then it, it came down to, you know, some folks bottom line, lost jobs, didn't have money, didn't have a cushion, didn't have anything. And so it was a, a matter of directing people to where they could get meals. So what I found was that our community and a lot of communities uh, in our state really stepped up. Folks were wa working, I know I was working um, double digit hour days and other people were you know, barely sleeping, trying to make sure that all of our families and, and programs and children were getting all the stuff that they needed. So um, even though that was tough and, and remains tough, it showed um, the ability of a lot of us to really step up to the plate and do what needs to be done. And so I feel like it, it revealed um, it, the all, we're all in this together kind of mentality that is what we need to move forward in, in an equity push. In Oak Park and River Forest, um, in 2017, a 10 part docuseries came out um, about the very renowned in the area and well respected high school that we have, which turns out um, wonderful scholars, kids go off to awesome colleges. It's really a great, great, great program for a lot of people. But what the documentary revealed was that it was not necessarily an equitable experience. It was not a great program for um, a certain subset of children, uh, in a lot of cases, children of color. And as a result, uh, Oak Park and River Forest have been in a real equity conversation uh, for the last two years. And so it, it, once you are talking about something uncomfortable, like the idea of equity and, and what that really means, like um, the privilege that people have to acknowledge and um, the inequities that, that sometimes get ignored, once you've been doing that for a while, people start getting a little bit of compassion fatigue and get, 
you know, we get to the point where people are like, okay, well, we've talked about this, you know, it's over. Fortunately, um, we had a pandemic that revealed the, the kind of underside of the things we were ignoring. And what I see as the, the biggest opportunity from this pandemic is that we can, we can take those inequities, hold them up, really examine them and figure out real ways to get around them, to get past them, to build on top of them to make a better world. Because the world that we knew is, is gone, at least for a while. So while we've got this semi-blank slate, we need to take this moment and create something brand new that is actually equitable for the children that we're trying to serve. So, and one last thing, just as someone who was a teacher and loves teachers, sorry, um, this is a moment also for folks to change their attitudes about work. Uh, all the people that, all the companies and, and organizations that felt like their employees couldn't work from home, haha, guess what they could, because they're doing it right now. Um, parents and, and families who felt like their teachers were um, not doing enough work, were being unfair to their children, haha, you know the truth now, don't you? You know exactly what that looks like and you're only doing it with one, two, three kids, not 20 or 30. So I feel like this is a moment where attitudes can change, where understandings can change and we can create a new, a new harmony and a new synergy that will then make it easier for me to do my job of trying to get everyone to uh, coordinate services for, for children from birth through life. Now I'm done. Thank you, Heather. And Martha, succinctly, tell us. Yes, what I will. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I just want to uh, uh, put out that in these last five to seven years, many of us have been exploring uh, trauma-sensitive uh, uh, curriculum and trauma-sensitive environments and really looking at uh, the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And now uh, it's gonna be more important than ever. So uh, we know that the brain learns best when it is um, less stressed and not under um, uh, too many um, adverse conditions or having to live in that. And so we know that so many of our uh, kids are, are right now, if you will, trapped in um, some home environments. And by the way, uh, this actually crosses over socioeconomic uh, uh, bridges. There are some um, uh, perhaps even more affluent families who are under extreme stress right now. It could be economic, but it, um, we do know that things such as family dynamics, um, uh, alcoholism, addictions, all of those things that might be going on at home are going to be exacer exacerbated during this time. So I just really want to encourage all of us to consider uh, what we can do right now, but uh, in thinking about when kids do return, um, what's that going to look like and how are we going to uh, help kids um, heal and um, uh, keep going on um, uh, even after perhaps these very stressful times for them and for their families. Thank you so much. At the Institute, we have focused on quality, equity, and continuity in all of our work, and uh, the entire team has uh, focused on everything from ensuring that we have an, a resource and referral um, system in place so that we can connect families with providers, especially essential workers during this time. Uh, we are just making sure within the superintendent's plan that we are assisting principals with getting food out. Because uh, as was mentioned, uh, the families that are less resourced are having a really hard time right now with meeting basic needs. Uh, we are working with teachers or, because many of them have not had uh, experience in remote learning. Uh, so there, and then there's making sure that students have the technology that they need to learn from home. Um, in some situations, we're helping to deliver packets because we have so many families that just don't have, it's four kids to one cell phone and it's, the cell phone belongs to mom. So we are helping in any way that we can that principals are guiding us in currently, but also trying to be proactive and understanding that summer is a critical time. Um, learning loss is 
you know, Christine pointed out is going to be doubled or tripled for some students because they're not getting high quality instruction currently. And so our uh, eye is on that prize and helping principals in the fall to figure out how to assess students, figure out how to offer individualized instruction and catch them up as much as possible and giving them options to look at around uh, best practices, potentially extended day, extended year tutoring, um, a, a myriad of things that uh, we can do to help support them in their work. Uh, as Heather pointed out, we're not a school district ourselves. We're not running programs in the pure sense of the word. We are partners with the school districts. So I wanted to thank you all. Uh, it's a whirlwind when you have four people speak. Um, we've kept in time. Um, I was a taskmaster <laughs> uh, in the background, uh, but I wanted to open this up now to see if there are any questions or comments uh, about equity in early education. Thank you. You all can unmute yourself or several of you have been on this before so you know that you can put your question in the chat. I have a question. Can I ask or should I put it in the chat? No, that's perfect. Um, well, uh, hi, Lisa. Um, so good to see you. <laughs> um, so sad that you left. But anyhow, um, in um, Denver and um, in the metro areas, many early childhood um, uh, have closed, you know, closed. And I am connected with the many directors and they are worried about that day may never come back because of, uh, as you know, early childhood is, is not supported by the state. You know, like, it's not like K through 12. It is through CCAP if you're in those type of areas, you know? And, um, and this has been affecting very a high quality, expensive early childhood that their, their parents have lost their jobs and stuff. And of course, if it's gonna impact them, it's gonna impact many low income families. Um, so anyway, um, I have been trying to open up early childhood for several years, but because of the facility, uh, lack of facilities, um, I couldn't do that. But now here I have this wonderful opportunity. I bought a bus um, and, and I'm converting it to early childhood. So, and I'm taking it to the low income areas to, um, uh, you know, to support those families, you know, uh, with uh, mobile ECE education. Um, it has been also, it's been rather difficult because the kind of licensing you get is a after school licensing. So CCAP and all those entities does not give you money. So you have to raise your money through foundations and stuff like that. And I really feel at this pandemic, this is the way to make equity, <laughs> you know, to make equity happens by having mobile and also going to the first respondents. And, you know, when they go to work, you're providing those services to them. So I just was wondering if you guys know of any um, support that uh, my organization can get to provide the services because I'm very eager and I'm very interested, you know. So that's it. Those are great questions. I, I am familiar with the scene in Metro Denver, obviously, and we're having some of the same challenges in Metro Omaha and throughout Nebraska. Um, and congratulations to you on figuring out a solution that um, will help serve so many more families that aren't able to drive to Montbello, for instance, where you were before. So that's wonderful. I, I would say it's going to be difficult. I, um, there are folks in the Trump administration uh, like Lynn Johnson, who's from Colorado, who really does understand uh, this opportunity to um, support early care and education. Uh, so I, I would say 
currently and into the future that we're, we are really going to have to uh, figure out a way for the federal government to assist us with building better. Uh, and everyone's using that term in different ways, but uh, the mixed delivery system in early care and education has not worked um, for all. And uh, COVID has um, had an impact you know, nationally on families in every way, shape, and form you can think of, but especially if you are less resourced. And so to, to your point, why, we don't have the answer the solution, except for to say that uh, if we can get childcare birth to pre-K or even kindergarten in some cases to be a public, a public will piece where the public is actually funding it because it's a true need in our communities, that's the way that this would be resolved. Um, that it's a universal service for families. And that's not something that can happen tonight, but there's an opportunity here to have those conversations. And um, the U.S. now knows that child care is essential. Yeah, right. so, um, yeah I just wanted to let you know DPS is also closing many pre-Ks. Right, well DPS would close, when schools close, DPS closes. So no, actually no, they close pre-K part of their program, period. Right. They're yeah. getting rid of the pre-K completely. Uh, no, they're not, not, in, in, not in all of the schools, but in some of the schools, like about uh, five to eight. I read that in right. the post. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to get into that. I see Martha wants to answer a question, and we have a few more questions, but thank Sorry. you so much. <laughs> You're on. Hi, I, I just wanted to uh, quickly comment. I do agree that uh, this current situation may be something that uh, helps us uh, uh, level the playing field. And that um, as this uh, participant just mentioned about the bus here in California to reach our um, uh, uh, agricultural workers, to reach other people, they were using some of the school buses that, have wi that are Wi-Fi enabled. And so our local school buses are going to parking lots at Walmart, at Target, at different places, so that parents can drive in and use the uh, 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 Wi-Fi uh, while that school bus is parked there. So she needs to get Wi-Fi on her school bus as she goes to these neighborhoods. Yes. Good job. Thank you. Lisa, you're muted. Uh, I did want to answer the question about what schools might be doing in the summer and into the fall. At least this is from tons of webinars and lots of articles that I've been reading. Um, some schools might actually open, but they might have 10 students per classroom and practice social distancing. The teacher stays with the same students. Um, they'll the cleaning procedures, of course, will change on what they do within the classroom and on the playground. They're expecting older students to help with that, uh, as you could imagine. Um, also, obviously, they might continue with online learning uh, in the summer, as well as potentially in the fall. And so professional development opportunities for students, to, for teachers, to understand how to better utilize online platforms or some things that are going on, including in Omaha, Metro Omaha. And then finally, a um, couple of things staggering. So students going Monday, Wednesday, and, and the other students going Tuesday, Thursday with potentially having Friday off uh, might be one way that if the pandemic continues that schools might open in the summer for summer school and or in the fall. And then uh, there's conversations about what to do based on subject matter, whether it's literacy or math. And um, so I, I would advise, there's tons out there. Uh, John King, um, you know, who was with the Department of Education, I think he's been on almost every webinar I've listened to for the past month. 
So I, a lot of information is out there about what could happen, but everyone does know that there's going to be a gap and that we're going to have to figure out ways to address that. So thank you for that question. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, people are posting resources. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from anyone else? So Lisa, there was one up here that was earlier. Um, so I'd like each speaker to inform us of where they go to stay informed about equity. Is that what you just answered as far as there are lots of webinars and places people Yeah, can yeah, there are, but um, if everyone wants to share specifically about where they go for their information. And uh, Lisa, I, I also was thinking as people are maybe thinking of a few more questions for the panel, um, I was going to ask Dr. Crystal Rose, um, who's our partner with Ozzy, uh, we'd like to invite the parents of many of these children to our celebrating graduates next week because it doesn't have to be someone who's graduated. It's somebody who maybe they've pressed pause and maybe they can't finish their degree for four more years or whatever it is. They're taking maybe one online class a year because they're managing you know, kiddos and the pandemic and all these things. And so Crystal, would you just um, jump on for a second and just share because she's planned an incredible um, event. We have a great event all week, but she's the culmination and it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. So Crystal, go ahead as people gather their questions. Thank you so much, Carol. And thank you so much EC team for sharing this really important discussion. Um, and just in continuation of that, we really are opening this up to people who really want to celebrate and to really herald what our first gen, they're doing today and all the different uh, things that they are doing to persevere and to push on and to really join in that moment um, of recognition. And we're having a two-part event. The first part is going to be more of a ceremony, sort of short TED talk style uh, conversation. Some of them are funny, some of those are interesting, but they're all meaningful in the journeys that these grads have undertaken. And the second part, um, there's also an opportunity to participate as a mentor, if you'd like to do that. The second part will be doing um, four different breakout rooms, everything from um, from a virtual dance floor to Mighty Mentor Mixers to peer empowerment, we welcome you. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you, Crystal. And we really think about learners at every stage of life. You know, there's grandmothers raising some of the children you all are working with. And, you know, we want them to feel supported right now when a lot of them don't have family support. So um, thank you. And we'll go back to questions. That was a little, uh, little commercial break for next week, but for the bigger network of the family. So thanks for letting us do that. So it doesn't look like there is another question um, in the chat. What, does anyone else, again, that hasn't spoken want to ask a question? I'll end. Uh, but I just, uh, if I can just have 30 seconds, um, I know that there's a um, uh, language that we use about getting kids caught up or when they come back, do we focus on literacy or numeracy? And I just want to remind you that the things that the kids' brains are missing right now are socialization with their other kids and play. And so um, my wish for all of our um, EC teachers is, is that that we don't go back wringing our hands, thinking that we have to um, uh, do thing, so many things to get kids caught up, that we really do look to see how they can play and socialize. That's what they've been missing perhaps during this time. So um, I know that oh, thank I'm you. preaching to the choir, but there you go. Martha, we totally agree with you. And, and again, for those of us who are working with children up to third grade, that early childhood is prenatal to third grade, we do need to consider how to support students around language and literacy. And so totally agree with you about how to do that in ways that promote a joy in learning. That's mm. 
critical. So, uh, one of the other things that Carol uh, pointed out in a within the group chat is just the silo piece, and I think that that's important too. I mean, uh, whether we're talking about uh, childcare, preschool classrooms, the K through three system. Um, this again is an opportunity for us to think about how to break down silos that have been there since the inception <laughs> of uh, <laughs> all of these systems and how, how do we again help folks to understand that all teachers, no matter what age they're teaching, need a livable wage, right? Mm -hmm. how do we make sure that all parents have the supports that they need, no matter what type of job they have or their income. So all of these areas, we have human services here, we have, you know, um, education here, and, and not a lot of mixing going on in consideration of how to support families. And that's what's been obvious, I think, with our pre presenters today. So, we're going to actually Lisa let me mention one other thing on that topic one of our partners is um, Jessica Rothenberg Alami and she started cell ed and they are delivering on the cell phone basic math reading and writing to get um, you know 40 million of the not literate adults yet to be able to be in basic jobs like CNA or early childhood care providers. And so this is another part of the pipeline is that we have these incredibly talented people, some of who can't read a cereal box, but they can be the most amazing early childhood care provider if we see more broadly their abilities. So, um, and many of them are technology, um, you know, broadband, tech and secure and food and other things. But this is on the cell phone. And so it's a really great, um, we'll put that into the chat. Um, I just think it's one of the very best um, resources. And she's doing a million person pledge she's launching in the next couple of weeks to get a million of these folks right now at a time like this during COVID. And she's also got all this COVID response in Spanish and everything. So I think, um, you know, we just want to resource you all with as many different kinds of partners to be able to provide this bigger ecosystem to feed the, the, the and nurture the people that you need to do a good job, but maybe not from the usual places. That's great. Thank you so much. So, and rounding out, if it's okay, I was just going to have Christine, Heather, and Martha maybe mention one thing that you might have uh, thought about as a result of participating in today's session. And we'll start with uh, Martha, Heather, and then Christine. Great. Well, I already kind of put in my last two cents, and that is, uh, again, um, that uh, uh, this is going to be a time that if you, if, if as a teacher, as a provider, if you don't have a lot of background yet in trauma-sensitive uh, environments and uh, uh, working with uh, uh, children in adverse, uh, ch experiencing adverse conditions, that this would be a great time to explore that. And there's lots available just for free on the web and webinars, et cetera. So um, stay healthy and take care of yourself. Thank you, Heather. Uh, yeah, to piggyback on Martha, we have to be um, filling our vessels as well. We, we're worried about the kids, but we have to be worried about ourselves too. We got to put on our um, mask before we can put the masks on the people next to us, right? So there actually have been a number of very cool webinars. Um, I attended a wonderful one last week that was very much needed about mindfulness, um, about slowing down because there is just so much coming at us, um, getting our own, own heads together so that we can be clear and really uh, help our kids and families as we head back into this world. And also connecting with each other. These webinars, webinars have, you know, we've been doing a lot of them the last couple of weeks. But um, it has really been wonderful for me to meet um, a bunch of people from across the country that I might otherwise not have gotten to meet. So let's all um, share our information, uh, make sure we stay in touch, figure out who does what you need. And because I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to a bunch of you guys to find out, you know, what I can get for, for the collab from you. Thank you, Christine. 
Great. Yeah, I mean, this has been really inspiring for me listening to the other panelists. I've taken all kinds of notes of things that we can bring back and integrate into, into the big lift. Um, and one of the last things that I, I wrote down when I leave this call, I go straight to a call with all of my um, providers for the summer learning program. And we're going to be talking about our goals and how we're going to structure that program uh, to make it safe for kids and give them what they need. And I just wrote, like, our goal this summer is going to be just to promote a joy of learning, helping them and took that they need the play and socialization. It may take them the full four weeks to get back into the academic routine to get those goals. So I want to get, I mean, took those words. I'm going to take them directly from this to, to those folks to reinforce. We're not worrying about academic progress over the summer. We're really worrying about meeting their needs so they can eventually get back to making the progress they wanted. And so that joy is what is going to be front and center for us. Well, and I have learned so much from all of you. I will be getting on your websites and stealing as much as I can <laughs> to uh, incorporate into some of the work that I am doing. Um, really appreciate the opportunity, Carol, to be on this panel. Um, again, thank you all. And what I hope and wish and pray is that our families have enough to eat that every child has a safe place to be and sleep and play, and that uh, when they are able to get back into school or into childcare, that they are welcomed with open arms. Awesome, and Lisa, on behalf of Lisa Wyckoff, who's our, our content coordinator who's worked with you all, um, we just wanna thank you and um, all of you for making time and all the attendees with so many competing priorities. And for every mother, happy Mother's Day this weekend. But we also want you to know that we're posting these. We have a Global Minded Event 2020 YouTube channel. And so for those of you who have wider networks, people who couldn't be part of this today, we hope that you'll take the um, insight of the last hour and be able to share that with people and those links. So um, thank you so much to everybody and all the time you put into this today. And um, please take good care of your health and uh, let us know how else we can support your efforts at Global Minded. And uh, we look forward to reconvening with this awesome panel and all of you um, sometime in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.